So this, just to let you know, this um, is an adaptation of a relational mindfulness practice that I learned from Marv Belzer, who teaches mindfulness at um, UCLA. Gratitude to Marv. So just today, I was mentoring a, a group that I see every month and one of the mentees asked um, about just this feeling conflicted with the worldly kind of pursuits and the Dharma pursuits that um, she was wondering whether she should invest her time. Her children were mostly grown out of the house um, but she was wondering if she should invest more of her time in, in making more money to support them and potential future grandchildren. Or if she should invest more of her life in spiritual pursuits in the Dharma. And I shared with her uh, a question that Thich Nhat Hanh encouraged us to ask ourselves regularly, which is, what is our ultimate concern? We have mundane concerns, we have the concerns of daily living, which are important, but we also have an ultimate concern. What are we here for, is basically the question. We all have a purpose here, an ultimate purpose. And that question, is meant to help us ask, are we living it? Are we living what our ultimate concern is? So it doesn't mean our, you know, the worldly things, the mundane affairs are unimportant, but if we see them as our whole life, we won't make space and time for the ultimate concerns, these deeper questions of why we're here. So I shared with her that material security is one thing that she can offer her descendants, but spiritual security, a spiritual grounding, a deep understanding of her own mind, her own body is another kind of offering that she can make to her descendants. And it may be more important given the direction we're headed as a human race. So there's a spiritual protection, uh, a protection from our spiritual practice that can help us see through the eyes of interbeing how to care for things and be compassionate. That may be a very important legacy for her children and grandchildren to pass on. So I also shared that when we take good care of the present moment, we are taking care of the future because the future is made of this moment. So when we live deeply this moment, the future is taken care of. We don't have to worry about it. I recently had a visit with um, a friend of our family's, uh, Andrew Young. He was a close associate of Martin Luther King Jr. My father also worked with Dr. King and so has been friends with Andrew Young for many decades. And he was talking about how important it is to be firmly grounded in a spiritual path. For him, in his case, it's been the black church in the US. That's been his refuge for his whole life since he was a young man. But he was reflecting on how important it is, especially when we encounter these very difficult times that we're going through all over the world to have groundedness 
because without that, we are lost. There is that story from the Gospels, from Matthew, about how important it is to build our house on solid rock rather than on sand. Because when the winds and the floods come, if our house is built on sand, it will get swept away. But if our house is built on rock, it will stay strong. And so this is a parable about our ultimate concern. Our ultimate concern helps us build our house on solid rock. So Andrew Young was telling me about how he had been raising money to bring oxygen accelerators from China to have them shipped to India, to Bihar, during this very tragic COVID crisis there. Each oxygen accelerator could support 50 people on oxygen in the hospital. And I, I told them I wanted to also make a donation to support that important work. And what he said to me was, it's your spiritual contribution I'm interested in more than the material. He was saying, keep your practice strong. That's where you need to focus. You know, yes, I'm sure material support is always welcome, but he was really reflecting back to me. What we really have to offer is what we, what we commit towards transforming our own minds in our daily lives. So this is from Ajahn Mun, my grandfather of the Thai forest tradition, is a monk in Thailand. He writes, of all the many things that people value and care for in the world, the mind is the most precious. In fact, the mind is the foremost treasure in the whole world, so be sure to look after it well. To realize the mind's true nature is to realize Dhamma. Understanding the mind is the same as understanding Dhamma. Once the mind is known, then Dhamma in its entirety is known. Arriving at the truth about one's mind is the attainment of Nibbana. Clearly the mind is a priceless possession that should never be overlooked. So our ultimate concern has to do with understanding our minds, not skimping on that important work that we're here to do in this precious life. So I traveled to India with Thich Nhat Hanh when I was a nun in 2008. And my father was also on that trip. We were about 100 monastics, I mean, 50 monastics and about 100 lay practitioners from all over the world. We were on a three-week trip to India to offer retreats and teachings in schools and also retreats for educators. And we also did a retreat for about 3,000 Dalit people in Nagpur. So we were up in the north in Dehradun, where we'd done a retreat for educators. And we were at the train station, to, about to get on the train. And um, so my dad, who's a fellow Dharma teacher uh, in the Buddhist tradition, as well as a Christian minister, he was with us, with me, and um, he had my bag, and I had some fruit in my bag, and there was people begging at the train station, so I asked him to give me my bag so I could give them some fruit, and he took off his bags, which included his laptop bag and 
a couple other things. And when he, when he got to his seat in the train, he realized he didn't have his laptop bag. That when he set all those things down, he didn't pick one of them back up. So of course it wasn't there when he went back to look for it and the train was about to take off. And I was in another car. And so he was beside himself. It had his you know, house keys, his phone, his you know, everything. And it was gone. And sitting next to him was a Muslim family, uh, a woman with two daughters. One was age six, the other was age 11. The one who was age 11 was sitting closest to him and her name was Hannah. So my dad was drowning himself in cup after cup of very sweet chai that was being served uh, down the aisles, worrying about all the things he'd lost in that bag. And he struck up a conversation with this young girl. He invited her to have a cup of tea with him, some biscuits, and she said she couldn't because she was practicing fasting for Ramadan. So they got to know each other a bit and he told her that he'd lost this very precious item and was deeply disturbed. And she looked at him straight in the eyes and she said firmly, uncle, you need to thank God for the good he has given you this day. My dad was not expecting that response from an 11 year old girl. But she knew something about discipline and where to put your mind, even in the midst of great loss, of great um, disruption. So that is what asking ourselves, what is our ultimate concern? And living from that question, it's what allows us to be able to relate the way she was relating, which is, means from a balanced place. So there's a, someone I love very much, AJ Musty, uh, an activist known for his work in the labor movement, the pacifist movement, the anti-war movement, the civil rights movement. There's a book from Robert Ellsberg called All Saints, and it's taking you know, everyday people and saying, these are saints too. You know, they don't need to be canonized by the church to be considered saints uh, in, his, in his view. So this is a story about A.J. Musty when asked by a reporter what good it did for him to maintain a vigil outside a nuclear weapons base, Musty replied, I don't do this to change the world. I do it to keep the world from changing me. So he, he had this direction from, from his clarity about what his ultimate concern was. And so Robert Ellsberg shares about him that long past the age when most activists grow weary with frustration, Musty displayed a vitality that was not fed by the need for tangible results. He wrote, joy and growth come from following our deepest impulses, however foolish they may seem to some or dangerous, and even though the apparent outcome may be defeat. So we, we do what we need to do. And, and he was doing this until his 80s. He retired from leading the Fellowship of Reconciliation in his 60s and then kept going to Vietnam to protest the Vietnam War, sitting outside of embassies, you know, getting arrested in his 80s. This is what he was saying, joy and growth come from following our deepest impulses. And it's not about defeat or success. 
So this is AJ Musty. And so his famous most quoted line is, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way. So it's about how do we live? What is our house built on? What are we building our house on every single day? What is our ultimate concern? It's not about the results. It's about how we live now. So in the same way, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. There's no way to healing. Healing is the way. There's no way to A healthy world, a healthy world is the way. It's not about what's in the future, it's about what we live and do now. So Master Lin Chi, um, the founder of the Rinzai Zen tradition shares, you already are what you want to become. It's already here. And a German teacher, Thomas Hubel, uh, current day, talks about how everything we need to solve the multiple crises that we face, the racial crises, the pandemic, the climate crises, the economic crises, crisis of leadership. Everything we need, we have it already. He talks about the need to heal collective trauma. And that, you know, what, what we live in are societies that are manifestations of unhealed trauma, that when one generation doesn't heal their trauma, it's like snow that falls and doesn't melt. It creates this layer of ice. And then the next generation snow falls and it sticks to that ice and it creates another layer of ice and then another and another. So all these previous generations who experienced great pain and, and trauma and that didn't metabolize it, they passed it on. And so our institutions are marked by a great deal of trauma. A lot of them are not very healthy institutions. Although there are elements of health in them and people working to bring about health. So he talks about how melting this ice of this unhealed collective trauma will reveal all these tools that are already there and that we, we need to be, each of us individually, courageous enough to recognize, to meet our own trauma, our own grief, to really work through what it is that we've been, been transmitted so that we don't transmit it to the next generation. So not, it's not about blame or judgment, but about seeing ourselves with compassion, seeing those who came before us who didn't manage to transform their suffering, seeing them with compassion. We've inherited unjust and, and in many ways destructive systems that, that we didn't choose and they were molded by this trauma. But as we learn to recognize and be with the trauma in us, we help that ice to melt in the collective. So caring for ourselves, our bodies, our moment to moment experience, 
making peace with our bodies. That's ecological practice. That is social justice practice. That is what allows us to move more whole into the world and um, help, help the collective ask this question of what is our ultimate concern. It's something we need to ask as individuals, but it's also something we need to ask as a society. Our ultimate concern is not trying to dig every last bit of fossil fuel up from the earth. But that is, that is a, a very big concern for a lot of people who have a lot of power. It's how to hold on to that power and wealth and continue to exploit fossil fuels. But our ultimate concern as humanity needs to be about and is, if we can just touch it, um, how do we really create a, a planet, a world that works for all of us? A place where everyone can be cared for and can thrive, that's possible. It's possible that the hundreds of species that go extinct every day can be protected. That the gap that's widening so big between the rich and the poor can be mended. It's, we must care for what is here and now and not sacrifice this moment for What's next? That's been the habit of our human globalized society to sacrifice this moment for short-term gain, to sacrifice the future for short-term gain. So, this teaching from Thich Nhat Hanh that we don't wash the dishes to get them clean. We don't rush through washing the dishes so we can do something more interesting like have a cup of tea or sit down and watch a movie. We wash the dishes to wash the dishes. And he says, we can wash the dishes like we're bathing a baby Buddha, like we're bathing a precious child. It means whatever we do, we do it in a sacred way. Whatever we do, it has that insight of what is my ultimate concern? What is our ultimate concern? What am I here for? Even washing the dishes is important. It has to do with what I'm here for. Even brushing my teeth is a moment of my ultimate concern. Even the way I talk to the person at the checkout in the grocery store, it has to do with my ultimate concern. Why am I here? So thank you all for your kind attention. And may we all live from our ultimate concern. So we have some time now if you have questions. Um, and I also want to let you know, um, as you may, may be gathering what you might want to share, or ask, or reflect on together, um, 
I'm going to be part of a team at Spirit Rock um, with four other teachers leading a two-year deeper dive called the Dedicated Practitioners Program or DPP, Dedicated Practitioners Program. It starts in April next year, but applications are being accepted until August. And uh, I'll put the link in the chat if you're interested. It's for more experienced practitioners. um, And you'll see there, there's some some requirements in order to apply. But if you're interested, it's a deep dive into the Pali teachings, um, the Pali canon of the Theravadan tradition. So, If you have some shares, some things you'd like to ask or uh, reflect on together. Um, Someone's asking if I have a regular Sangha. Uh, I do have a a Black Indigenous People of Color BIPOC Sangha that I co-teach. It's weekly Thursdays at noon Eastern through the Garrison Institute. And you can find out about that through my website, kyrajewel.com. And um, I may be starting a group that meets monthly in September that's open to the general public. So check out my website. And, uh, you can also sign up for my newsletter and I'll let you know in an email about upcoming um, regular groups, but I I teach in different places. Most are open to everyone. So uh, you can find out on my website and join any any coming talks. So we can also take a live question if you'd like. You can um, go to reactions and raise your hand if you have a question or you can share in the chat. Thank you so much for everything you all are sharing in the chat. I really appreciate your, your shares. Okay, I'll put my website in. Kyrajewel.com. No, I think there are a couple of hands up. Uh, yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see them. Sorry. Marilyn and then Lori. Marilyn, would you like to unmute yourself? Oops, I need to do that for you. Or maybe Lori, do you want to uh, ask? And then we'll see if Marilyn can unmute and ask. Yeah, uh, when I saw that you were going to be the teacher tonight, um, I noticed you have a book about to come out. Yes. And I wonder if you could, um, I ordered it uh, just because, but um, what was that experience like for you? It's a different mode than practicing and teaching. You know, thanks for that question. I, I kind of got lucky. So <laughs> I made a course for Insight Timer and I wrote out, script and then I recorded it. It was called Skillfully Moving Through Challenging Times, a 10-day course. And it came out right before the pandemic, like really good timing because people were stuck in their apartments for three months. And these were less, you know, lessons from my own life of moving through my own challenging times that seemed to have a lot of resonance for people in this really unexpected, you know, lockdowns and losing people and being sick and being afraid. And so um, 
So there was a lot of, you know, a lot of appreciation for this course. And then a dear one of mine who listened to the course just said, you should make this into a book. Like you have it already there. And so I was like, oh, that would be easy. And I, yeah, it, would, it happened pretty easily. And I did add new things and I changed it, you know, for, for it to fit as a book. But I didn't have that much to do to make it into a book because all the script was there. So, um yeah, it was kind of it was kind of a a fun and light way to do my my first book. Yeah, thank you for ordering it. I hope you enjoy it. And Marilyn, would you like to ask? A, oh, the name of the book is called "We Were Made for These Times: Skillfully Moving Ten Lessons on Moving Through." Uh, change, loss, and disruption. And maybe someone could put that link in the chat for how to order the book. And then the name of the course on Insight Timer is Skillfully Moving Through Challenging Times. Marilyn, do you have something you'd like to share? Maybe we've missed that. Um, Claudia. Go ahead. I'm Tom. I'm trying to unmute. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Hi, Kyra. Uh, Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Uh, I have been practicing for a while. And uh, one of the meditations that I do, which is kind of similar in a way of what you guided us through today is Tonglen, right? And uh, trying to wish others to be free of afflictions and all this. And my husband, who's not a practitioner and not a spiritual or religious person at all, sometimes questions, you know, like, what's the point of this? I mean, are people really going to benefit from this? And I truly believe that, I mean, we're energy and I feel like I'm, we're all connected and we're sending, you know, positive energy to people. And it feels like somebody else said, and it's so wonderful to feel self-compassion and also to, to feel compassion towards others. But can you explain, like, is there any scientific basis for this? Or is there any, like, how do I respond to somebody like that? You know, I mean, I believe in it, but I just don't know what... <laughs> Yeah. What kind of arguments, you know? Or... Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. That's really, I, I think many of us can relate to that experience. Um, well, the first thing I would say is, to me, the main reason for practicing Tonglen or any heart practices is to, um, is to grow our own heart. Because if we, you know, the Buddha taught that our heart can become immeasurable. These practices of loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, they can be cultivated to infinity. That's amazing, right? So that's like not a small thing to be on the path of making your heart so big that everything and everyone can be included in it. So that's the main reason we practice is for our own heart to know no boundaries. And that alone is, you know, to me, like inspiring enough that it works because it's changing me. It's changing my way of looking at people, my way of, you know, the fears, the ways I close down. When I practice any of these practices, I'm more able to keep my heart open. I'm more able to see, you know, how I am the victim, I am the perpetrator, how I am, you know, the person I identify with and I am the person who I feel alienated from. The other thing I would say is, uh, in addition to the effect this has on us, 
personally, um, you know, there are studies, I think by Larry uh, Dossey and others on the, um, the effect of prayer. I know Deepak Chopra talks about this, different studies that when they've researched people who are ill, who have people praying for them, people sending loving kindness to them, they have better outcomes medically than people who are in similar situations who don't have people praying for them. So there is actual research that shows that, um, you know, this isn't just a personal experience that we're having. However, <laughs> it's important to um, not approach Tonglen or Metta loving kindness practice with some outcome in mind. Like that story of AJ Musty, you do it joyfully, even if what you even if what it looks like the outcome is, is defeat. So you send love to someone, you send care, maybe they don't get better, but that doesn't mean you stop. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's, it's, it's mysterious how things work, right? We don't know exactly what the effect is and it may not look like what we're hoping it to look like, but if it's enlarging our heart, it's creating, you know, we're not separate from the world around us. If we're cultivating love, then we are creating a force field of love that is beyond just this form. And so that, that has some effect. We don't, we can't always pinpoint exactly, well, I meditated on this day and then this happened in this other place or with this other person, but something has changed in the larger field. So there are some studies that, that show things clearly and, and I think there's a lot of unknown about how it works too. Um, but I think the best you know, way for your husband to taste the effects of this practice are in how you interact with him or in your own life because of your practice. I love what you said about, about uh, growing our heart and then keeping it open because yeah. you're so right. I mean, when we really start thinking about our conditions, our origin, origin, origination yeah. or whatever, and start yeah seeing the similarities and then we can be more compassionate and less judgmental mm -hmm. yeah. and and it's so true and then we can mm -hmm. see more of the connection it's, yeah. it's beautiful oh. thank you thank you so much thank you so much claudia thank you for your practice yeah well it looks like we're at time and i just want to say i'm so grateful for this chance to be with you all um, thank you so much for your patience with the um, relational metta loving kindness practice. Really appreciate you being willing to try a new, <laughs> a new practice there. Um, and thank you so much, Tom, for your, um, yes, someone used the word heroic. <laughs> sure. Uh, thank you for being. Yeah, so. I, uh, I hope we'll, we'll get to meet again in some, somewhere, somehow. So thank you all. <laughs>